light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh as always i'm joined in the studio by my producer joel and today we are diving into the most haunted places in the wonderful state of oklahoma which is actually interesting because joel and i lived in oklahoma for i think four or five years yeah i would say so in our uh earlier life i think joel was in preschool at the time when we moved there mm-hmm. and i was uh in first grade i think we spent four or five years there i don't know what you, what do you remember of oklahoma mainly all the tornadoes <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say that's what i remember too is just the the thunderstorms are unlike yeah. anything and the tornado sirens going off and then Go our on. our house at the time didn't have a basement so i don't our... think anybody has basements there which is weird oh wow yeah it's like not a thing in in tornado alley to have a basement <laughs> so I guess some people have cellars or or storm Hmm. shelters and things like that, but a lot of houses don't have basements like we do here in Colorado. Yeah, Yeah, it is crazy because we we piled into the bathtub a few times. Yeah, or our parents would take us down to the park where they had a storm shelter. The neighborhood shelter. Do you remember that? (laughs) Yeah, dude. Remember how crazy that was? Oh, man. It's like you you get into this like swampy underground container, basically, Uh and honestly it's scary yeah it's just scary to sit there and hearing all the thunder going on just like the chaos the sirens outside going off. Yeah, yeah we were we were in oklahoma uh, i believe during the time of the i think it was the more oklahoma tornado i think is what it was it was a really really bad one that happened it was like an f5 yeah that took out a I bunch of, that of neighborhoods and um but yeah we definitely experienced a few tornadoes there but today we're going to dive into not the tornadoes that plague Oklahoma every year, <laughs> but rather some of the most haunted and paranormal active places in the state. So when I looked it up, Oklahoma is ranked number eight as far as in the United States for most haunted state. Interesting. So it, I, it definitely has a tragic history. It does. So. I mean, Oklahoma might be best known for its history of football. I mean, football is huge in Oklahoma. Go Sooners. Oil and barbecue but it's also known for its racial violence, merciless tornadoes like we were just talking about, Western outlaws, and the impressive amount of paranormal hauntings that plague the state. And in this episode, we're gonna dive into some of the most haunted places in Oklahoma, where its grim history gives way to its paranormal present. To start things off, we're gonna talk about a place called Stone Lion Inn. In Guthrie, Oklahoma, A Victorian mansion stands on a quiet neighborhood street. This three-story house is taller than every other home on the block, and the stone lion statues near the front door remind everyone how luxurious this house is. But despite its wealth, its rooms are plagued by haunting energy that dwells inside. The third floor is known to be haunted by a little girl named Irene, and she's been inhabiting the house for decades. The Stone Lion Inn was built in 1907 by a merchant named Frederick Houghton. And he was a wealthy man that had invested in cotton farms and real estate. He had a very large family, including 12 children. So he bought the land next to his old family property and built the mansion that still stands today. It's an 8,000 square foot home that was the most expensive house in town at the time of $11,000, which in today's money, it's worth nearly $350,000. Inside the house, there are three fireplaces, an oak panel dining room, a massive wooden staircase, and a smaller backroom staircase that leads up to the haunted third floor. The third floor actually has a ballroom, as well as a playroom for children. And nestled in the corner of the room is a closet that stores the children's toys. When the family first moved into the newly built mansion, their daughter Irene was diagnosed with whooping cough, a highly contagious disease, especially in young children. At first, she only had a slight cold, a mild fever, and a small cough. But after a week or two, her coughing worsened. She would fall into severe coughing fits as she gasped for air. She would make a high-pitched whooping sound. She was taken to the doctor and given medication, but as her condition got worse, she began taking too much medication. Until one day, her mother found her sprawled across her bedroom floor. Foam poured out of her mouth, and she had died of over-medication. Her death nearly destroyed the family, but they learned to move on. But not long after, Frederick fell on hard times and began losing money. So they all moved to Enid so he could open up a retail store. While away, they leased out their old home, and it was turned into a boarding house and later a funeral home in the 1920s. Frederick eventually passed away in 1948, and the house went up for sale. 
A family by the name of Walker bought the home and lived there for several years. In 1986, Becky Luker and Sons bought the mansion. By then, the building had fallen apart over the years, but they worked to restore it to its original condition. They then turned it into a bed and breakfast that still operates today. The grounds are filled with pecan trees, flowers, and lilac bushes. And every morning, guests wake up to fresh coffee, blueberries, strawberries, and muffins. At first, it seemed like such a pleasant place to stay. The new owners had no idea that the little girl Irene had died in the house all those years ago. But they would find out the hard way that something was terribly wrong with the house. Not long after they began restoring the mansion to its former glory, they noticed strange noises. And they weren't just noises of the old house settling in. Children's footsteps would rattle up and down the stairs. The old rusty door hinges would squeak as the doors randomly opened and closed on their own. Other times, Becky would tell her youngest son to put his toys away in the third story closet, but the toys that had been neatly put away would later be found scattered around the floor. Some believe her son was just trying to get out of doing chores, but others believe the ghost of Irene had taken the toys out and played with them. As guests began staying at the inn overnight, some would fall asleep comfortably in their beds, but in the middle of the night they would feel the small hands of a child trying to wake them up. Sometimes they could feel Irene softly stroking their cheeks during the night, or others claim that a small, smoky figure would try to tuck them into bed when they went to sleep. They also noticed their glasses or other small objects would disappear from their nightstands. And later, strange, dark formations would appear in photographs that they hadn't noticed before. Others have reported a male spirit, possibly Frederick, that can be seen smoking a pipe in the late hours of the night. He appears as a shadow at the end of long hallways or sitting in the living room. Many can smell the tobacco from his pipe after he lights it with a match. As the hauntings continued, fewer people wanted to stay at the inn. So the Lukers decided they would use the haunting to their advantage. And they began hosting murder mystery nights. As many as 40 people would show up and 20 would stay the night. And throughout the evening, they would eat a seven course meal. But sometime in the night, one of the guests would mysteriously disappear, and this was all according to plan. It was a game, and the rest of the guests would have to figure out who the murderer was. Of course, strange noises can still be heard throughout the house, as the ghost of Irene wanders around the third floor, but the murder mystery disguises the strange noises as just another part of the game. And the guests don't think twice about the disturbing paranormal entities of the Stone Lion Inn. Not far from the Stone Lion Inn, there's a watering hole known as the Blue Bell Saloon in Guthrie, Oklahoma. The Blue Bell is the oldest operating saloon in the city. Its story began in 1889 when a man named John Samsell gathered up his family and left his home in Kansas. He had heard of an opportunity in Oklahoma where there was a land rush. If you're not familiar with that, a land rush was when previously restricted land in the U.S. was finally opened to the public on a first arrival basis. Basically, whoever got to the property first got to own it. So John tried his luck and he ended up staking his claim at lot number nine. He set up some tents until the wagon brought him supplies to construct his first building on the property. In the meantime, he opened up a restaurant and sold cigars out of his big tent and he called it Blue Bell. He later leased the property in 1892 and over the next two years, a frame building was constructed. It became the Blue Bell Saloon on the corner of Harrison Avenue and 2nd Street. After struggling to make ends meet, John lost the property and it went to a sheriff's auction in December of 1897. Over the next several years, the property was in and out of several property owners' hands. And in the early 1900s, the old framed building was replaced with a strong brick building that added more space and a second floor. And it was on this second floor where secrets hid. The first floor was still in the old saloon, but the second floor became a place for shady activity. It acted as a secret gambling establishment, and it had 17 private rooms attached to the gambling area. No one knows exactly what the rooms were for, but many suspect they were used as an underground brothel where women were trafficked in and out. Soon an alley was paved behind the building, and a secret tunnel was carved through the basement, and another stairwell led up to the second floor. As the legend goes, this back stairwell was a secret entrance for gamblers and prostitutes. It was also rumored that the secret tunnels brought women in and out of the brothel against their will. As for the second floor, 
Only the guests with an official invitation were allowed to go up there. Not many knew what happened behind closed doors, but supposedly, young underage girls were forced into prostitution. Some of the girls were often sold as sex slaves to the woman that ran the brothel, and that woman was only known as Miss Lizzie. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the saloon had become the local watering hole for several different gangs. After robbing banks and trains, they would stroll into the Bluebell for a drink and young women. Plenty of murderers and lowlifes hung out at the saloon and spent their time on the second story. And plenty of famous people also spent time there, including President Theodore Roosevelt. But no matter who came in through the front door, there was always some mystery surrounding the second story. It's believed that Miss Lizzie's brothel had a much darker story. There are no records for what happened in her brothel, but the sex trafficking of the early 1900s was terrifying to say the least. As the story goes, two of Miss Lizzie's underage prostitutes died on the second floor. One was named Claudia, and her parents sold her to Miss Lizzie so they could save the family farm from foreclosure. And Claudia was put to work in the brothel against her will. One night, she was requested by an older gentleman looking for a young girl to give him company. After she was led into the private room, it would be the last time Miss Lizzie would see Claudia alive. A half hour later, they found Claudia dead, sprawled across the mattress. Her body was covered in blood and bruises surrounding her neck like she had just been violently choked to death. She was alone in the room and the old man had already fled the scene. Miss Lizzie didn't want her sex trafficking operation to be uncovered, so they didn't go to the police. Instead, they took Claudia's body and buried her near the saloon's coal chute. This was near where the old secret tunnels used to be. And supposedly, Claudia wasn't the only young girl to die at the brothel. Another girl was named Estelle. She was sold to Miss Lizzie at the age of 15, but her death remains a mystery. If she was killed by a patron or took her own life, we don't know. These deaths didn't stop the operation. Everything went on as usual for years. But just as the saloon was becoming the most popular place in town, Oklahoma became a state in 1907, and political events eventually ended the saloon's business. Prohibition became a part of the state's new constitution, and all of the state's bars and saloons were forced to close. As time went on, the building became several different kinds of stores, including a second-hand goods store and a furniture store. And it wasn't until 1977 when the building was sold and the new owner restored and renamed it the Blue Bell Saloon. But many of the new patrons noticed that something wasn't quite right about the building. Over 70 years had passed since the saloon was first closed, but the horrific events of its past left a permanent mark on the building. Many people began seeing the ghost of a black-haired woman throughout the saloon. They believe it's possibly the ghost of Miss Lizzie still running her brothel operation as a spirit. Others have heard the whimpers and cries of young girls begging for help on the second floor. They might be the cries of Claudia and Estelle, and their spirits are still enslaved to Miss Lizzie's brothel. Occasionally, the ghost of a 40-year-old man can be seen wandering around the basement. He wears a handlebar mustache and a brown derby hat. The people who have crossed his path say that he's always extremely angry about something, and he often swears under his breath at himself. He tends to wander near the old coal chute where Claudia was buried over a hundred years ago. He might have been the man that killed Claudia, and his spirit is in a constant state of guilt and shame. Along with the ghosts in Bluebell, cameras have been known to get knocked out of guests' hands. Objects like beer mugs and pictures on the walls appear to move on their own. Doors open and close by themselves, and strange black shadows dart across the rooms. Nobody knows what the ghosts want. And most of them remain a mystery, the same way that the gloomy history of the saloon's second floor will continue to remain a mystery. But today, the Blue Bell still stands as one of the oldest buildings in the town of Guthrie. And the horrific deeds carried out behind closed doors have left a permanent paranormal scar on 224 West Harrison Avenue. Want a new credit card but not sure how to choose? You don't need to apply for the first offer you see in the mail. Credit Karma can help you zero in on the right option for you and apply with more confidence. Credit Karma uses your credit profile to show you offers that are tailored to your financial situation. Credit Karma partners with a wide range of card issuers so you can be sure that you are exploring all sorts of options. 
Best of all, Credit Karma uses your credit data to show you your chances of approval before you even apply, helping you apply with more confidence. Comparing credit cards on Credit Karma is 100% free and won't affect your credit scores. Credit Karma, create your own karma. Ready to find the card for you? Head to Credit Karma and check out your personalized mix of offers today. Go to creditkarma.com or the Credit Karma app to find the card for you. That's creditkarma.com. Ready to find the card for you? Head to Credit Karma and check out your personalized mix of offers today. Go to creditkarma.com or the Credit Karma app to find the card for you. That's creditkarma.com. On the northeast side of Oklahoma in the city of Pryor, the Thunderbird Youth Academy is now a military school. But back in the 1940s, it was used to be an orphanage for unfortunate children. For years, they lived on the property without ever leaving. They played in the yard, ate in the cafeteria, and went to bed in their small sleeping quarters. Small bunk beds filled the building where the kids stayed at night. And in 1942, tragedy struck. In the middle of the night, a nearby tornado touched down. But the weak wooden building wasn't built to withstand the high-speed winds. And as the tornado crept closer to the sleeping quarters, the wind blew out the glass windows, tore off part of the roof, and even took down some of the walls. Chaos broke out as the young children tried to run for safety, but they had nowhere to go. Shards of glass cut through their bed sheets and debris flew through the air at lethal speeds. Many of the children ended up dying in the storm. The first responders and orphanage staff were horrified when they found them early the next morning. Bodies and debris were scattered across the orphanage grounds. They had been lifted up by the tornado and thrown across the property. The children who had survived stared blankly out at the field of gore. After the carnage was cleaned up and the bodies were buried, they rebuilt the academy. Now many of the buildings are made with brick and mortar. Although they're much safer from tornadoes now, the spirits of the dead orphans are believed to wander the halls and terrorize the sleeping quarters. After the students' long day of schoolwork and physical exercises, they return to their sleeping barracks. Students have woken up in the middle of the night with dark figures standing at their bedside, glaring at them. Sometimes the dead children will appear next to them in bed, weightless and cold. But one of the most famous ghostly children of Thunderbird Youth Academy didn't actually die in the tornado like the rest. His name is Hector, and his fate was different than the others. As the story goes, Hector had been a student at the academy, and one day the cafeteria cook lured him into a closet and killed him. He then disposed of the body by chopping him up into small bite-sized pieces and hid his chopped body parts in the school meals throughout the week. Today, the ghost of Hector supposedly haunts the third platoon building. He's known to move furniture, turn off lights, and appear in front of other students. If the life of a military school student wasn't already hard enough, now they have to deal with the spirits of dead children haunting their sleeping quarters. Also in the northeast corner of Oklahoma, there lies the city of Tulsa, one of the most haunted cities in the United States. It has a deep, complex history, and the horrific things that have happened there are impossible to forget. In the next story, we're reminded of the incredible power of religion and the threat of eternal damnation. Carol Ann Smith was born in Indianapolis in 1893. Her father, Thomas Carey, worked for the Indiana Glass Company and made a comfortable living for himself and his family. He sent his daughters to private school and they attended church every week. Growing up, Carol Ann strictly learned her Bible lessons and often sang in the church choir to please her parents. When she was only nine years old, her mother suddenly died in 1902, so her father was left to raise his three daughters by himself, and he never remarried. Carol Ann always respected her father, especially after raising his daughters by himself. She always said that he was a great man, and he always provided for his family. She loved the fact that her father made a lot of money when she was growing up, and she became used to that lifestyle. She never had to worry about money. About 10 years later, the family moved to Muskogee, Oklahoma because Thomas got a new job. And in 1914, when Carol Ann was 21 years old, she met a man named Faye Smith. He worked as a salesman for several steel companies at the time and made a lot of money, just like her father did. Carol Ann was a young, attractive woman, and she quickly caught his eye. And it didn't take long before they quickly fell in love and got married not long after. Her life seemed to be going almost perfectly, and she was a happily married woman. But a year later, her life took a turn for the worst. She became pregnant with her first child, but she gave birth prematurely, and her son died only a few hours later. Heartbroken about the loss of her son, she fell into a deep depression, but they tried to have another child. 
So in 1919, she became pregnant, but again she gave birth prematurely and her second son died not long after. She wanted to try one more time to have a child, but her doctor advised her not to. He said that her body wasn't strong enough and it was a risk to her health. And as much as she wanted to have children, she eventually accepted that she never would. Despite her terrible loss, the couple went on to live a lavish lifestyle. Her husband had a great job and made a lot of money. And although she still grieved, she slowly learned how to be happy again. When her husband got a new job in Tulsa, Oklahoma, working for a wire rope company, they moved into an apartment nearby. They continued to live with their life of riches, but soon the Great Depression struck. And in 1933, Faye was laid off from his work, and he couldn't find another job. After struggling to find a job for months, he eventually became an insurance salesman. The money he made at his new job was far less than what he used to make, so they couldn't keep up their life of luxury. Carol Ann was used to the lifestyle of buying new clothes every week and never having to worry about money. But things quickly changed. As their lifestyle slowly dwindled, Faye mysteriously disappeared on January 22, 1934. According to a local newspaper, he called Carol Ann at 5.40 on Monday evening and said he would get back to their apartment for dinner soon. But by the next morning, he still hadn't returned home. And the next day, police found his body lying near his car in Osage Hills. When they inspected the body, they found a single shotgun blast had torn open his chest. According to the police, he had used a tree branch to pull the trigger of a shotgun aimed at his own chest, killing himself. Many men during the Great Depression were committing suicide, and he had talked about his dark thoughts to his wife for weeks before his death. But after Carol Ann received nearly $450,000 in today's money from his life insurance policy, his death became suspicious. Unfortunately, the officer investigating Faye's death died soon after the investigation began, and Faye's death faded into the background. Now a rich widow, Carol Ann moved into a duplex in 1935 at 10 East 21st Street in Tulsa, a house that would one day be known as the Hex House. She wanted her father to move in with her, as she thought it was too big to live in alone. So he agreed to, but when she traveled back to St. Louis to help him pack up his things, he suddenly died, and she received another massive life insurance payout from his death. She had enough money to live comfortably for years, but she still didn't want to live alone in the massive duplex. Eventually, she found two roommates to live with her, Virginia Evans, who was 31, and Willetta Horner, who was 30. She met Virginia in 1937 at a Christian science bookstore and quickly became friends because of their shared interests, and Virginia moved into the duplex soon after. Then Carol Ann met Willetta at a grocery store in 1938, and they bonded over the loss of their mother at an early age. Willetta moved into the duplex not long after they became friends. Years passed, and the women continued to live together in the duplex, but neighbors had no idea what was truly going on behind closed doors. The strange sounds and suspicious behavior made them annoyed with Carol Ann as their neighbor, but they dealt with it for years, not knowing what was really going on. Meanwhile, by 1944, the U.S. had joined World War II, and common grocery store supplies had to be rationed. So citizens were given ration stamps to buy their goods. Carol Ann couldn't stand being limited on supplies and clothing. So during this time, Carol Ann applied for seven ration stamp books, claiming that she needed them for her children, dogs, and dependents, but she didn't have any children. She also got several books for her dead husband, her dead father-in-law, his maid, her bulldog, her 10-year-old nephew, and her two roommates. And this quickly raised suspicion with the ration board, so they asked the local police department to investigate her for fraud. They first began questioning her neighbors, and surprisingly, they all had bizarre stories to tell. They had heard screams and growls coming from the duplex, and they once saw the three women burying something behind the house at midnight. So police obtained a search warrant, and when they dug up the backyard, they found two small coffins. Inside were the remains of two dogs. One of them was her bulldog, Bonbon. Bon. But this was only the tip of the iceberg. They were about to discover the dark and twisted deeds that Carol Ann had been performing behind closed doors. As police entered the house, they found Virginia and Willetta. They were barefoot and wore filthy clothing. They were also skinny and pale, and they begged for food. They had just enough water for them to survive, and they weren't given any extra water to wash their clothes. They smelled like they had been wearing the same clothes for days, possibly even weeks. Police searched the house, and they found the women's sleeping quarters in the freezing cold basement. 
They slept on blankets that were put on top of wooden milk crates. The police had no idea how long the women were living like this. But eventually a repairman that had worked on the house came forward and talked to police. He said at least one of the women had been living like that for months. He had actually come by to repair the furnace in the middle of winter, and he found one of the women in the basement with thin clothing and no socks. He told her he had to cut off the pilot light in order to work on the furnace, but she begged him not to, as this was her only source of heat in the basement. The rest of the heat from the furnace went upstairs. As the two women lived in terrible conditions in the basement, Carol Ann had lived upstairs in luxury. She used the women as personal slaves, and they cooked and cleaned for her every single day. Meanwhile, she had an endless supply of makeup, perfume, and silver. She had 18 pairs of gloves, 26 hats, and over 200 pairs of shoes. And much of the things in her home were supposed to be rationed during the war. But she had abused the ration stamp system. She had also convinced Virginia's father that Virginia was severely ill and that she was taking care of his daughter. So he sent her over $17,000 throughout the years. She had also committed several different kinds of insurance fraud in order to support her rich lifestyle. Even though Willetta and Virginia had jobs outside of the home, they always returned and worked for Carol Ann. They also gave her all the money they made while they stayed locked away in the basement. And when police asked why the women would agree to something like this, they told the police that Carol Ann had put a hex on them. They also claimed that she had hypnotized them and manipulated them with occult powers. She had forced them to disconnect from their family members and through intense manipulation, she had convinced them that they hated each other. Through Carol Ann's wicked practices, she created her own religion of Christianity fused with occult beliefs and manipulation. And she convinced the women that Satan would drag them to hell if they didn't do her bidding. She also screamed at them and physically beat them if they didn't listen to her commands. She had taken control of these women psychologically, and they learned to never fight back. When police finally found the women in the basement, they could tell their spirits had been completely shattered. They were underfed, dirty, and on the verge of dying from dehydration. As the news broke of Carol Ann's occult behavior, the town of Tulsa called her the Hex Mistress, and the duplex on 10 East 21st Street became known as the Hex House. In October 1944, she went to trial, but not for the crimes you would suspect. She was tried for persuading Virginia and Willetta to falsely testify against a neighbor. After three days, she was found guilty and sentenced to one year in prison. She later pleaded guilty to perjury, mail fraud, obtaining money under false pretenses, and lying to get a ration stamp book for her dead dog, Bon Bon. After serving her time in prison, she left Oklahoma never to be seen again. Many believe she changed her identity but continued living a luxurious lifestyle. And although she disappeared... The Hex House still sat on East 21st Street. As decades passed, people reported seeing several apparitions at the property. Some even heard dogs barking when there were none around. Figures could be seen running out into the street and screams of terror came from the cold basement in the middle of the night. In 1975, the Hex House was eventually torn down and the basement was filled in with dirt. Now, all that remains is an abandoned parking lot. But something haunted still inhabits the property. There have been mysterious reports of cars starting on their own while parked in the lot, and ghosts have appeared as strangers walking across the cracked cement. Locals believe that the occult energy that Carolina had once summoned for her hexes still lingers on the property, and many also believe that the dark energy will remain there forever. We've all had a bit too much to drink before and woken up with a splitting hangover. Who hasn't? If you're trying to make it to brunch, a workout, or anything else after a night out, Bloom can help you prevent the next hangover with just one scoop in the morning. Bloom Nutrition makes it easy and delicious to give your body what it needs to fill your best inside and out. Their greens and superfood powder blend fights bloating, helps digestion, increases natural energy, and keeps your skin glowing. Bloom greens are packed with over 50 nutrients, including whole fruits and veggies, fiber probiotics, antioxidants, and more, all in one easy-to-drink formula. Mix it in with water or add it to a smoothie like I do to add it to your daily routine. It comes in four delicious flavors, coconut, which is so good, mixed berry, citrus, and original. Bloom is made for you, whether you're trying to recover from a big meal or a night out, or you're a fitness buff. Over 350,000 people trust Bloom to feel better every day. And right now, Bloom Nutrition is offering our listeners 15% off your purchase of their greens and superfoods blend when you go to bloomnu.com lightsout. That's B-L-O-O-M-N-U 
bloomnu.com slash lights out for 15% off your purchase. Go to bloomnu.com slash lights out for 15% off. Also in the same city as the Hex House, the Camelot Hotel wasn't too far away. And the massive pink building used to be the highlight of the city until its demise in the 1990s. Built in 1965, it was originally called the Camelot Inn. It was an eight-story tall, 330-room building, and it quickly became the prime spot to hang out and celebrate in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The interior was beautifully decorated, and its exterior looked like a light pink castle with stone gates and a fake drawbridge. Even the pillars at the top of the building looked like castle defenses. It was unlike anything else in town, and people used it for all sorts of events. It attracted plenty of colorful characters from one day to the next. On one day, they would hold a tractor convention, and the next, it would be the Miss Oklahoma contest. Then high school prom, a family reunion, or a civics club meeting. Almost everything that happened in Tulsa happened in the Camelot Hotel. Thousands of people wanted to stay at the hotel, and they called the sensation Camelot Fever. Even Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley stayed in the hotel at one point. Lavish cocktail parties were held in the Red Lion nightclub inside, and it became one of the most popular places for late-night hangouts with a bit of class. But despite its lively decorations and exciting energy, a sinister force swept through the hotel. The days of celebration and fun wouldn't last. By the 1990s, the hotel had become old news. It passed through several different owners who all had big dreams to restore the hotel to its former glory. But that day would never come. One owner tried to turn it into an apartment building, but residents were forced to move out when the health department condemned the building in 1996. Inside were exposed wires, raw sewage, and overall filthy living conditions. The once fancy hotel had become a disgusting pit of sewage, trash, and fire hazards. But millions of items still remain inside. Fine dinner plates, antique lighting fixtures, old paintings and medieval decorations filled the dark interior of the abandoned hotel not to mention the spirits that took over the hotel once it was empty. The building rapidly fell apart and a storm fence was put up around the building to stop anyone from entering. But a handful of mysterious fires plagued the hotel and the entire building became one massive fire hazard. Officials thought it was local arsonists setting the fires, but some thought it was the ghosts that had taken over the abandoned building. At night, locals would pass by the hotel and see how run down it had become over the years. Sometimes they noticed lights flickering on and off up on the 8th floor, and occasionally, between each flicker of light, shadowy figures would appear in the window frames, and they would slowly pass by and disappear from view. After years of blight, mysterious fires, and property damage, the owners of the hotel gave up on it. Vines took over the hotel walls, and the rest of it fell into ruin. Occasionally, burglars and vandals would break in, but most of the building had become a safety hazard, and word had spread around town that paranormal energy infested the top floor. Windows became littered with bullet holes, and pipes began to burst, and strange howling noises came from the dark corners of empty hotel rooms. But the city couldn't tear down the building because it was still structurally sound and privately owned. Eventually, after years of neglect, the building was torn down in 2007. The demolition costs were more than $1 million, but the locals were glad to finally see the eyesore gone. And those that were suspicious of paranormal spirits taking control of the building were also relieved, and they hoped that whatever hauntings that had manifested inside were also destroyed, along with the building. If the city of Tulsa didn't already have enough haunted places on the list, here's one more. The Tulsa Theater is another building with a cursed history, and another reason why Tulsa is one of the most haunted cities in the United States. Built in 1914, it was known as the Brady Theater. It was later renamed because of the name's connection to W. Tate Brady, a politician connected to the Ku Klux Klan. But renaming the building won't ever erase Tulsa's past history of racism. The theater was first known for its vaudeville performances, but in 1921, it was used as a detention center during the Tulsa Race Massacre. For two days straight, mobs of white residents of Tulsa attacked black residents and destroyed their homes and businesses. Many of the white residents were deputized and armed by the local government, and by the end of the massacre, 39 people had died, and more than 800 were hospitalized, and nearly 6,000 black residents had been detained. And the Tulsa Theater became one of the buildings they held the prisoners in. The 
The massacre became one of the most racially violent and deadliest terrorist attacks in U.S. history. And this brutal history might shed some light on why many believe the theater seeps with dark energy and why paranormal reports have become so common. Because after the massacre was later refurbished in the 1930s and again in the 50s, but much of the theater has remained the same. And the small wooden chairs remind guests of its long history. One of the most famous hauntings in the theater is by an opera singer named Enrico Caruso. He had performed at the theater in 1920 and it's believed he caught a cold during his visit. He had to walk at least a mile in the rain to reach the theater on the night he performed. And a year later, he died from lung inflammation. Many have heard strange opera singing or fits of coughing coming from the corners of the theater after hours. But Enrico wasn't the only one cursed by the theater. Many believe that a stagehand had hung himself backstage and another worker had died from falling off a ladder. Current workers and security guards have reported strange sounds and uncomfortable feelings throughout the building, especially at night. Lights mysteriously turn on and off by themselves, and unexpected equipment failures have happened during and before concerts and events. Some of the equipment failures could have been lethal. Paranormal investigators have camped out inside the building before. The Oklahoma Paranormal Research Alliance toured the theater in 2002, and they recalled how its main rooms and passageways are massive. The theater can hold nearly 3,000 people and many stairways, tunnels, and storage rooms can be found throughout. There's no telling what's happened in the hidden rooms deep within the building. During the investigator's stay, they found a long basement tunnel filled with wires and pipes. And as they walked into the pitch black tunnel, they heard the disembodied voice of a man saying something, but they couldn't understand what he was trying to say. Let's listen to the voice. After their visit, they said the place was so huge they wished they could return a few more times to try and communicate with the ghosts who inhabit the Tulsa Theater. And to this day, it's still one of the most haunted places in Tulsa, and its rooms have seen some of the darkest events in U.S. history. And it's no wonder that a building riddled with so much paranormal energy has also seen this country's darkest hours. Like we've talked about in so many episodes, it's, it seems pretty obvious why these places still have so much paranormal activity, even 100 plus years after violent or evil acts take place within these structures, that there is this residual energy, this residual negative or dark energy left over that just has nowhere to go. So it just fuels all of the activity that paranormal investigators and people like experience while visiting all of these haunted locations. Out of all these locations that we've covered, what do you think is, in your opinion, the most haunted one? For me, the story of the Thunderbird Youth Academy is the most terrifying. It's literally the stuff of my nightmares. I don't know about you, but I still have a tornado nightmare sometimes. Yeah, me it's, too. <laughs> it's one of my scariest like nightmares that I have, and it, it's the same type of thing. It's like in the middle of the night, and just a, a, a hear you can hear and that's what's so scary about tornadoes is that they can hit at night but it's just the sound that they make the violent wind yeah, it's and... it sounds like a train yeah. coming through this massive force like it, it's just so much power behind it and it's there's something about tornadoes that's inherently evil yeah, you know what i mean i'm like right. there's nothing good that a tornado does no at all. no all it does is just cause destruction and mayhem everywhere it goes mm -hmm. And I think, I just think the story of the wiping out the orphanage is just, is just terrifying. I mean, it's just yeah. absolutely horrible. What about you? For me, I find the Camelot Hotel and the Tulsa Theater the most haunted because I, I've seen in other paranormal shows and things like those types of places hold like a lot of paranormal activity. And yeah, it's always theaters and hotels. It's yeah. weird. Like there's, you could go across the United States and many states out there and i guarantee you when we cover other states it's going to be a recurring thing i know of hotels and theaters and I, I don't know if it's just the amount of people that go in and out of those places or definitely i think that's definitely know. part of it i think just the amount of energy and souls that go through these locations definitely has something to do with the amount of activity because it also you know the more people you have the higher chance there is of 
something bad happen, yeah, right? True. The more people you have going through a single location. And and when you think about a theater or hotel too, it's like obviously there's hotels that are massive, massive resorts, but it's always like the smaller uh hotels and especially ones that have a lot of history to them. Yeah. I, th- I think it's also the older hotels uh that have the history behind it because mm-hmm. Things were a lot worse back then. I mean, yeah. it's it's just a, it was a whole different time period back in the 1800s and early 1900s. A lot more lawless, a lot more violence and crime. Yeah, and people just didn't live as long. Like right. People died way, way more often than they did now. So mm-hmm. I think that plays into it as well. And it'd be interesting to like think about 50 years from now if like, you know, the Super 8 Motel... <laughs> You the, know, the holiday on, down the on street Colfax, or you know, yeah. if that is ends up having, you know, sort of a haunted mm-hmm. history behind it, be, you know, after so long, I think, I think a lot of these haunted places are because it's been around for hundred plus years. Yeah, it's very interesting how, how that stuff is even born from created. Right. But it's like, you know? and in the same thing, like, I think we'll find hospitals, hospitals, oh, yeah. you know, a lot of old hospitals, especially and just like back then things are just brutal and, mm-hmm. and people and there's just way more things to die from it seems like like yeah. nowadays obviously you know you can still die from a lot of the same things that were around back then but your chances of survival go way up and mm-hmm. and i don't know i i don't know if this is true or not but it seems like overall most people's lives are happier and a little bit more easygoing than it was back then and it was just such a rougher way to live i don't Definitely. think we can even wrap our heads around what it was like to live in the 1890s oh man and what that actually looked like because yeah i mean you know you're talking about it, it just like a time before a lot of these states were even states and there was the laws and and you know it just makes me think of like red dead redemption oh i know you dude. know what i mean <laughs> yeah. and like it's just like it's exactly like red dead redemption it's yeah. a great that game is a great representation of what that time what period was like, like your yeah. 1900s 1800s i mean yeah, you could go on a fucking lawless streak for a while uh-huh. and, you know, do a bunch of crazy shit. And, you know, before you knew it, the saloon that you just, yeah. you know, took out is all of a sudden a haunted location. Yeah. And that was another one in, in this how we covered the saloon. The Bluebell Blue, Saloon. Yeah. 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 That that's that doesn't surprise me. It's all these places where there's interactions with people. Yeah. And places where there's a good probability that something bad could happen. Mm-hmm. What places are that? Well, saloon is a great place yep. for that kind of stuff to happen because people are drinking, gambling, partying. Yeah. You know, there's seedy people hanging out in those types of places. Definitely. So it just raises the chances of it. And well, I just wonder if there's, I wonder if there's other things that maybe we just don't even understand that is more to it. Maybe it has something to do with the land, the land as well true. that it's built on. Well, thinking about the movie theaters or just the theaters, like, is it because in those places people can go through different stages of, of emotion, like from pain yeah, to yeah. sorrow to, you know, could happiness? Be. Could be. Yeah. Or like you said, is it just the land? But there's a lot of theaters out there, old theaters that are haunted. So yeah, it's just puzzling. Yeah. And like people doing crazy shit in them, like people just like people taking their own lives, people yeah. murdering other people in theaters. Yeah, it's it's interesting that there's this commonality between haunted locations and haunted buildings and things yeah, like that. Yeah, it's very interesting. But then, but then I'm sure there's going to be some places out there that you're just like, what? And, you know, mm-hmm. it re- some this horrible thing really happened there. But I, I do think it has to do with the, the just the sheer number of uh, of souls and energy that go through these, these places over a lar- large period of time. And I think if you go 50 years into the future, 100 years in the future, there'll be places you know, maybe the local Walmart will be, you know, one day <laughs> a haunted location. I mean, yeah. a lot of fucking crazy shit happens at Walmart True. these days. People get shot at Walmart. I mean, there's yeah. so many horrible things that happen um, everywhere now, yeah. too. I guess, you know, in some ways it's safer and you have better chances of living these days. But at the same time, it it's spread out more, right? Yeah. We have so many more places to visit. And also people are home a lot more right. than they used to be versus back in the day you know if you want to get a drink well there's one bar it's the bluebell that's saloon. a good point yeah so like nowadays we have so many different places to go that there's not that concentration right. that there used to be and so yeah. maybe that's why we see a decrease in hauntings uh-huh um because that because i'm like when we look at the paranormal and hauntings it's always historical yeah it's always going back into history looking at things that have happened 50 100 
hundred plus years right. ago versus like two years ago. Yeah. Or, you know, why isn't there still like every day, you know, obviously people go into historical buildings today and experience things, but why, why is it that I don't go into my local Walmart and I have, well, actually I'm trying to think, I feel like I had something weird happen to me the other day. I'll have to, I'll think, I'll think about well, it. And that makes me think of like, for an example, our old podcast studio, it was a brand new studio, but it was built on land that we think is possibly yeah. haunted. So I think land has a lot to do with maybe these newer buildings being haunted. Right. You know? Yeah. Or, or people take shells of old buildings and then rebuild them mm -hmm. or remodel them. I think about a lot of the, the city, a lot of cities now and, and how people are bulldozing lots oh, yeah. in like old neighborhoods, old historical buildings, and then putting up new, like fancy modern condos or houses. And I wonder, and I'm like, I wonder if people in those types of buildings, even though their building may not be haunted, could the ground be holding some of that dark residual energy yeah. and they think they might have cleared it out. Right. But in actuality, it's still there and can move back into a new structure. I wonder, mm -hmm. I wonder if it works like that. I, it sounds like it. But yeah, super interesting. Yeah, no, I, I'm really interested in, in looking at different locations across the world, across the United States. And, you know, if you have any suggestions of, you know, which state we should cover next and eventually we'll go into other countries. I mean, we can look, there's so many haunted places across the planet. It's insane. We could, <laughs> yeah, we could do a whole podcast called Haunted Places. Seriously. And, and that's all we do. But yeah, let us know which which building we talked about in Oklahoma that creeped you out the most. We want to hear your thoughts. As always, you can leave us a comment if you're watching on YouTube, which uh, Joel puts a ton of work into the video version always. of the show to really give you that full experience, that immersive experience that we try to provide here at Lights Out. So make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. You can also watch the show on Spotify now, which is really cool. So if you would, make sure you're following us over there as well. That's the best way for us you know, that helps our rankings, just helps our show's performance. That's what we're measured on actually is Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So if you're just watching on YouTube, if you wouldn't mind hopping over there, it does really help us out. Also, you can leave ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, which is really cool. Let us know how we're doing, how much you like the show. We do look at all that stuff. So we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Merch is coming soon, hopefully in the next month. I'm working very hard on that every day to try to get a new collection for you guys and we have some other cool stuff coming along as well but that is where we're going to wrap up today's episode of lights out thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time until then lights out hey everybody <laughs> <laughs>